Yeah, I think my job is to is to bring to bring about the opportunity for them to experience things like this and to try to give them enough variety that if it's not you know if it's not this event maybe it's something else. Um, but I feel very strongly it is my job to provide the opportunity and to try to make them aware of of what's happening. And when it works, and, and I'll be honest, I, I think it always works for somebody. You know, somebody in that room is getting touched by you know what's going on around them. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer, and this is episode number 32. My guest for this episode is Mark Norman. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening and for your support. If you find value from the show and haven't already done so, please leave me a rating on iTunes. You can also follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you're really loving what you hear, you can support me on Patreon at patreon.com backslash Mark J. Connor. Now on to the episode. Hi, Mark. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining me. Oh, it's my pleasure. So, Mark, if you could tell the listeners a little bit about what who you are and what you do. Sure. Um, I am currently the director of wind ensembles and the tuba euphonium instructor at the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, which is located in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I also am the owner, co-owner, really, with my wife uh, of the Charlotte Music School in Charlotte, which is about a school of about 250 students. And for this year, I'm also helping to cover a sabbatical for my mentor, John Locke, uh, at UNC Greensboro. So I'm a visiting professor with them as well, where I direct the symphonic band and teach conducting classes. Excellent. You're very busy right now. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So can you tell me about your musical background, especially your origin story? How did you get your start in music? Well, you know, I, I don't come from a musical family, but I have a family that was always musical, meaning that my dad used to love to play harmonica. I was always, I mean, completely throughout his life, I was always amazed by how well he could play harmonica. And it was just natural to him. My brother sang some and he was uh, uh, really pretty well known as a very good singer. Um, I came along a little later around the uh, fifth grade and uh, started in band like a lot of us did. and actually. It's kind of a funny story. I mean, some of us who are old enough will remember this. There used to be an aptitude test that Summer uh, gave out. It was like a little electronic test where you put on headphones and you had to tell whether a sound was higher or lower or longer or shorter. And um, we took that test in the fifth grade. And while we were waiting for the results, it took several weeks to get back the results, uh, you could join the orchestra. So I actually started on cello for about, oh, maybe three weeks. And then the results came back and it said that um, I had passed the test and I had enough aptitude to be in band. So I quit orchestra and joined the band, which I just think back to that and go, oh my goodness, if I was the orchestra director, how upset I would be. But uh, I started off as a trumpet player. Um, I was an, a pretty good trumpet player, but uh, then in the seventh grade, my best friend had braces and we were both first and second chair trumpet. And we both switched to tuba at the same time. And, um, and that's when I became a tuba player and still to this day. Um, but I started off around fifth grade. So sorry, Mark, I'm laughing <laughs> because you were in the orchestra playing the cello and then you left the orchestra yeah. to be in the band. And then you and your friend were the first and second chair trumpets and you both changed to tuba. <laughs> oh, I remember our band director just looking at us like, I think this is a good thing or maybe this is the worst thing that could happen. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think in the, up- in, in the end it's a good thing, but I mean, it's just, just sort of like, Oh, and it really did work out because, uh, we had a, uh, a girl, her name was Sandra Teglis. Uh, Sandra became one of my best friends. It's still to this day one of my best friends. Sandra came into the school, moved in, and uh, we used to do these old playing tests on Fridays. And, you know, you go down the row. And, of course, since she was new, she was in the last chair. And when she got, when she started playing, everybody in the whole room just turned around and went, oh, there's our trumpet player. And she uh-huh. was first chair the next day. <laughs> I see. <laughs> so he didn't miss us at all. <laughs> right, right. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, it's, yeah, you know, I was I'm struck by that Selmer story. I think I took the same test as a as an elementary mm-hmm. school student, and I'm struck by you know Selmer doesn't make string instruments. Last I checked, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so they knew what they were doing. I don't <laughs> want to anger the Selmer people. If you're listening, oh, sponsor me. <laughs> Come on the show. That's right. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. Excellent. So, w- where did the story lead from there? What do you have a uh, any experiences from middle school or high school that are memorable to you? 
Yeah, I really do. I have lots, to be honest with you. I was incredibly fortunate to have such uh, talented and committed uh, directors along the way. And, um, one was Tom Graham, who was uh, my uh, junior high school band director. And and Tom, um, one of my first real experience in band where I really remember how much I really loved it and I knew that this was probably going to be a part of my life forever, was when we went to a festival and a concert festival and we got a superior rating. And I just remember the feeling it was, you know, that, that all of us had at one time, that sort of group feeling stayed with me for a long time that we accomplished something together, something much larger than we could accomplish individually. And I remember that feeling uh, really very, very well. And, you know, and in high school with all the all state and all district bands and stuff, I got to participate in and one in particular with Joseph Phillips, who was the, uh, the commander of the, United States Navy Band at the time. Uh, Later was my boss <laughs> when I was in the Navy Band on, on his second stint as the leader of the band. Uh, we had a captain by then. And, um, but that, that 12th grade experience, I mean, 11th grade experience, uh, where we did uh, Chike 4, I just, you know, the transcription of it, I just remember I've won. I'd never seen that many notes uh, on a uh, tuba part in band before. And I really enjoyed it. That was just, again, a memorable weekend. Um, there were many other instances, but in my junior high and high school career, that was really the two things that really stuck out to me. Um, uh, now, when I got into college, again, so many things at UNC Greensboro, John Locke just brought in incredible people. And uh, the most memorable, I always say this, is probably my top five, uh, maybe number one musical experiences in my life was with uh, Grohusa. Uh, came in to do music for Prague. And uh, it was just one of these concerts where I was very ill. I had an incredibly bad sore throat, uh, so bad that I couldn't even eat soft ice cream. It just was miserable for me. And I was literally drinking chloroseptic <laughs> to get through the concert. But Huza, I noticed that when we were getting towards the end and the tanks are coming in and you could just see in his mind, he was really taken back to that time. And it drove all of us into it. And again, it was another one of these collective experiences that has stayed with me throughout. I remember when we got, we were all just playing at the absolute, you know, highest ability we could play at because of the moment. And when we got done, I mean, we just, I mean, he did. And all of us just sat there for a good 10 seconds, at least. It had to be, it seemed like for minutes and where we just went, wow, something really special just happened. And um, yeah, I've been trying to recapture those moments and try to share them with my students and try to provide those moments for them ever since then. It's, and a real big influence on me. Yeah. One of the themes, the recent themes of the podcast has been this idea of experience. This uh, first came Mm -hmm. up with Giovanni Santos's episode, and he talked about trying to give his students at at his university, La Sierra, an experience. And, you know, as he's saying that, I've been really thinking about that myself and thinking back to these moments that sort of made me want to be a composer or continue playing the trumpet or go on and be a music major. And so would you say that that's that experience that sort of was the springboard? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, that particular one has resonated with me for such a long time. And, and I've been lucky enough that, you know, I, I had, I got to do that piece three times with Huza during his lifetime um, at, in many different stages of his life and certainly more in many stages in my career. Once there with UNCG, also he came to the Navy band and, uh, and did, and uh, we performed music for Prague with him. And then later uh, when I was getting my doctorate, at UNCG, he came back and uh, and did that concert. And I got to spend some really great time with him. I, I shared with him that story about how meant it, how much it meant to me. And I could, you know, again, he's uh, he was a special, absolutely special person. Um, one of the most gifted composers I certainly have ever, you know, talked to or worked with. But more importantly, just an incredible person um, mm-hmm. who had so so much life experience that he was willing to share. And yeah, that has definitely inspired a lot of the things that I've done, especially putting events together and bringing people to my students that I know that they would never forget. And um, I occasionally hear from those students, especially the ones, you know, uh, at schools where I'm no longer teaching, who will remind me of, hey, I saw this on my Facebook page. This was a memory six years ago. I can't, you know, I still think about this, you know, all the time when I'm teaching and I'm, if that's, that's, that's what it's about. <laughs> it's, it's sharing those experiences and living through that. It's something very unique that music presents to us. Uh, it really does. Yeah. Has the ability to bring it all together. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Can you share some of those mm-hmm. experiences from the, the recent ones? 
Yeah, I'll give you one that has come up recently because of uh, David Moslink is passing. Uh-huh. Uh, I had David come in um, and work with my group at Washburn University when I was teaching there in Topeka, Kansas. And uh, the first time we, we came in twice, and the, the first time we were doing his second symphony, we were doing the, just the last movement of it. And I, I had also set up at the same time during his residency, I set up a uh, an in service for all the local uh, music teachers. I was fortunate I was able to pick a day where they uh, had a teacher work day. And so what I did was I contacted the schools and said, hey, listen, instead of these music teachers going to a teacher work day where most of the time they're doing stuff that really doesn't have much to do with them, <laughs> I, I said, bring them over here. I give them a full eight hours of things. So it was counts towards their recertification. And I said, you know, I have this world-renowned composer coming in. It's a great opportunity for them. And fortunately, they bought into all that. And we had, oh, I'd say, um, maybe a hundred um, band and orchestra directors uh, join us for that weekend. But my, for my students, the, and we did some open rehearsals and things that were all set up for that. And my students really, you know, they knew they loved his music. I mean, that, that was the first thing. They fell in love with him because of his music. And then as they got to work with him, they got to see somebody that was so inc- incredibly spiritually driven and who believed in them. And that's something about David I thought was just, man, it's just something I, I, I really took from him. I think about it all the time. It's how much he believes in the ability of the students in front of you, that they can play this very complicated and, and integrated music that he has written. He believes they can play it. And, and so he was constantly pushing me and constantly pushing the ensemble to do more, to do more, to do more. And uh, one, it's a great experience for me, but I could see what my students, they were just like, they realized they were around something, someone who was special, but also a moment in time that was special. And uh, when he passed away, you know, a couple months ago, I heard from many of those students saying, I want to thank you for bringing Dr. David Maslanka into our lives, our lives, because this is a memory that we can share for now, you know, until eternity, until you know, they can just get pass it on from student to student that, hey, I was there with David Maslanka. And um, you know, I feel the same way. That's why I felt about Husa. I also feel the same way about Maslanka. Uh, it's just that we're those kind of experiences and moments in time are things that last for so much longer than just a weekend. They, they last for the entire, you know, your entire life and the people that you pass it on down to. So um, that's one in particular that has recently happened, I think, is, is noteworthy. Yeah, no, and you're absolutely right about that experience carrying with you your whole life. That's what you never forget. David Mislenko was a very special man. He really was. Mm-hmm. Anyone who's well, yeah, listening to this- the, the, spirituality in him. Yes. was just so strong. Yeah. I like what you said about his belief. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah, I've, I've said this on this podcast before I had an opportunity to sit down and and kind of bend his ear over lunch. Um, it was kind of at a transition point in my own career and he kind of sensed that like he was able to kind of like sort of work through my own thing. It was really odd Mm -hmm. and kind of inspiring (laughs) the way he was able to just kind of get right to the the point, you know, right. What I mean. And and that's the, and that's what was so great about him too, that he could identify something so quickly and go right to the source of it. Mm-hmm. And then you knew, you knew at that point you were becoming a better person, a better musician right at that moment. <laughs> yeah, and that's the way I felt when I was on the podium and he was behind me, pushing me to do more. And I was like, wow, I, I, I thought I was doing this, but nope, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> I needed to do this. Yeah. And uh, like I said, I think, I think it was so beneficial for me and my students and for all those different directors and educators that were watching, um, you know, many of them just came up to me afterwards and said, you know, right now I would be in some class about, uh, you know, how to load a bus. <laughs> Instead, I'm working with David Moss like, <laughs> and I said, yeah, that's what it's about. Let's open the doors. Let's make sure everybody gets involved in it. Do you have a sense of how we can capture that and how we can bring that to our students, that idea of making it bigger? What, what, what do you tell your students about that? Well, I, you know, I try to, and I think a lot of us do this, we, we try to impress upon our students that, hey, this is something that you're going to want to be sure you're available for. And I don't just mean like, okay, it's in my calendar, I can, I can be there. But like, Sit down and absorb what is around you. Get off the cell phone. Get off the social media. You don't need it at that moment. Take the time and give give yourself a break to actually absorb this this moment. I keep saying a moment in time. I was going to say it again, so it's probably maybe the 
tenth time I've already said it, but I, I really do believe that, that they need to, I say that even for rehearsals, but especially when you, you bring in somebody like this, I try to make sure that they know, hey, this is, this is something that you're going to want to tell people later that you did, because it's going to mean something to you. But it will only mean something to you if you allow yourself to be available for it. And, you know, if you're, if you're too worried about what else is going on in the world at this moment, then you might miss it. Mm-hmm. Sure. Sure. So Mark, after uh, you were a graduate student or you were an undergraduate at UNCG? <laughs> yeah, I have. Okay. I have probably <laughs> the, the strangest timeline for a career of maybe possibly anybody that might be on your podcast. I would, I would dare say I have a, a very unique uh, sequence of events. I, I was at UNC Greensboro as a tuba major uh, back in the 80s. I, I got there in 1983. John Locke's second year. I like to tell the students there now. Um, and I was there for five years. I, I had uh, switched my major from music ed to music performance. That's a long story, but I'll just tell you that it involves a Kentucky Fried Chicken commercial. I do one thing and do it right. I really wanted to be a tuba player. So <laughs> that's, yeah, there you go. Um, and <laughs> the, uh, I switched my major Sorry because to laugh. I wanted, I know, well, you, I, I'm laughing with you. <laughs> <laughs> I hear a student of mine say that to me now. I'll just go, oh. <laughs> the, joke, the jokes write themselves. <laughs> The joke is on me. Wait, you <laughs> on know, I'm going to tell everyone we're recording yeah. this on October 10th, 2017. Just this weekend. Did you yeah. see the Suzavone caught up in the football netting? I did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Carry on with being a tuba player. <laughs> Very good. That's right. Oh, we can all be proud. So the, uh, the, anyhow, I, I was very fortunate. I, uh, had a great tuba teacher talking about opportunities. He gave me all sorts of opportunities. And one of the biggest ones was he was the principal tuba of the North Carolina Symphony. And I often got opportunities to sub with, with the orchestra. And uh, my professional career really did start inside of my, my undergrad. And it was really thanks to Dave Lewis because he believed in me. And that's what opportunity is. He believed in me. And uh, I was very fortunate. I won a job with the Navy band. Uh, my senior year, I had 16 hours left on the in my undergrad. Uh, but I took the job of course, and I, I, it was a great job. Um, I mean, it was maybe down in DC. So, um, I got to play next to some remarkable players, but I, I left school with 16 hours left. I went to DC, had, uh, you know, an incredible time in Washington DC. I lived there for 14 years. Uh, in, in the time I lived there, I, I just sort of transferred, uh, my career from being a tuba performer and, and uh, to more being, it kept switching more towards conducting. I, I started a, a community band in Wyoming County, Virginia, which at the time was the third fastest growing county in the nation. And now it's just huge. Uh, but at the time, it, it needed people like me to start different things. So I started the Loudoun Concert Band, which I think is now the Loudoun Symphonic Lands. And I started it. I directed it for five years. I started another group called the Riverside Wind Symphony, which was sort of a semi-professional ensemble. And... Uh, and then I started a pro ensemble called the American Wind Orchestra. And you know, slowly, I went from like maybe 20% conducting, 80% tuba, to like 50-50 to 80-20 the other way, where I was conducting most of the time. Realized that, hey, I really love this conducting. I really love new music. I love working with composers and 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 cre- in the creation of new music and in my role in it. And decided that I wanted to do more collegiate level conducting. and. I was very fortunate that Towson University hired me as the uh, assistant director of bands um, back in uh, 2001. Yeah, 2001. And um, without a degree, mind you, <laughs> I don't know how I pulled that off. Um, the nearest is John Locke, by the way. But uh, I, I, I got the job um, mainly because of my experience. And uh, I did that for a year and realized, you know, I really want to be a, a wind band conductor on the collegiate level. And how would I do that? And of course, what I needed to do was go back to school. So uh, that worked. I decided to move back to Greensboro. I dropped everything, moved back to Greensboro, finished my undergrad, which was a non taking that 16 hours turned into 48 hours. Um, I did that. And then uh, I, I, the plan was for me to stay there for my master's while I was getting my master's degree in conducting. I was uh, fortunate that School of the Arts, uh, UNC School of the Arts, um, needed a wind ensemble director, and they hired me to do that. And so I de- decided I was going to stay for my doctorate as well because it's such a great job. And I always connected just so strong with that school. 
And um, from there, I finished my doctorate and got a job at Washburn University and taught one year at University of Michigan and a couple of years at UW-Milwaukee. And in that time is when my wife said, when are we going to get out of this cold weather and get back to North Carolina? <laughs> and that's when we decided, hey, let's look at some other opportunities in North Carolina School of the Arts. Um, you know, at the time, uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get back there or not, but uh, it worked itself out that I did. But um, I really bought the music school because we wanted to live back in North Carolina. And um, that has worked itself out completely. And here I am with so much to do that I don't know what to do with myself. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's worked itself out. But I have a very different career. I've done that pretty much everything backwards. I got the gig first, then I started all the conducting stuff, got all the experience, had to go back to get the degrees. It's taken me a lot of different places. Uh, but we're glad to be home. Yeah. Well, you know, my wife and yeah. I have a saying in our house that the harder we work, the luckier we get. So it mm-hmm. sounds like you worked and yourself into you, your luck. <laughs> all you, you're totally correct on this. But again, what the, the, the sequence of events could never have been planned. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I was extremely fortunate that, that again, people believed in me and they, and they helped me out through so much of all it. So I, I've been a very, very fortunate person. But I know that you're a terrific musician, a great conductor and tuba player. But I want I guess I wanted to talk a little bit more about the personal relationships you've built. Yeah, I think honestly, um, I think the best thing we can do, you know, I, I say this to my, my tuba students certainly and, and any student who's wanting to pursue a career in performance and music is, you know, you can't will yourself to win an audition because you're not on a committee. And in that room there's gonna be several different opinions on on what they hear, and then that's on like a traditional type of audition. What you can do is put yourself in position to be uh, considered for these positions, or you can be more of an entrepreneur and and create your own uh, ensembles. And you look at ensembles like Eighth Blackbird now that have such an unusual you know instrumentation that they have created something completely unique for themselves. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an existing type of organization. Maybe you're going to create something that is new and has a new sound to it, a new timbre, and a new uh, concept, or maybe it's, maybe it is something more traditional, like a brass quintet or a woodland quintet or a string quartet or what have you. But, um, how you put yourself in position is that you get your yourself, you get your playing level to such a, a point where other people want to play with you. And then you can start collaborating. And that's, to me, that's putting yourself in a position to be a, a valuable and working musician, that others want to be with you. Others want to do that. And of course, what I've also told them is the greatest education I've ever had was playing next to players that were just so much better than me <laughs> that I had to catch up. Uh, one in particular, I was playing with the Washington Brass in uh, D.C. I played with them for about seven years. And the uh, the trombonist in the group at the time, uh, there were two different trombonists in the group, but both of them played with the Baltimore Symphony. And every rehearsal was a lesson for me. I was just like, oh, wow some of that sound, look how consistent that is. Oh my goodness, I have to make sure I blend so well with that sound to create this sound, this, this composite sound. And that education, oh my goodness. So I, I for me, I think I, I got myself in a position where people were believing in me because um, I, I got myself at a ability level and, and also, you know, fundamental level when I could, you know, I could sight read. Um, I could you know, walk into a, uh, I knew my excerpts. Um, which, oh, by the way, in professional sense, sight reading is most of the time do you know the repertoire. <laughs> Not necessarily are you reading something the first time, even though a lot of times it is. But a lot of time it's, hey, you got no rehearsals and you got to play low and great. You know low and great. Yeah, because I know my excerpts. You know, So now they trust you that you know the le- repertoire. Maybe it's brass quintet with it and so forth. So I, I think a lot of times uh, it's uh, what I think, you know, where I got my opportunities from was because I at least put myself into a position where I could you know, succeed in those situations and people would trust me. And, um, but I also think there are plenty of people who can do that. Um, and so the other part of it is, are you somebody that people want to be around? Are you a good person? <laughs> you know, can they trust you? Well, you, well, they know that you'll be there. <laughs> um, all of those things come in play. And, um, yeah, I don't think that's unlike other businesses. I think people want to be able to rely on you, but what they're relying on is not just, are you going to show up and wear the right clothes, which that's a big part of it, or uh, you know, are you going to show up and actually contribute? Are you going to be a contributor to the ensemble, uh, or are you going to be somebody who's throwing potholes <laughs> at, you know, at the ensemble and they, 
get a pothole and go, oh, what was that? <laughs> you know, they, they want to go on a smooth road. <laughs> so putting yourself again in position to succeed, I think uh, that's our, our personal responsibility. And then we have to sort of check ourselves, make sure that are, are we, you know, are we the pe- persons, are we the person that other people want to play with or even better, or are we a person that, you know, you would want to play with? Um, so there's a lot there to consider, but I think that's where my opportunities came from. I was, I was lucky enough that people believed in what I was doing and um, I got lots of opportunities early on. Yeah. I mean, that that's a terrific sort of bit of advice. I mean, sequence of advice you just gave there. I want to unpack a little of that. The first, the, the idea that you make yourself as good as possible to attract others to you. And then you're a good person on top of it. I mean, that's the magic formula, but you know, to this in a, in a way. Yeah, and, and it doesn't mean you can't change. I mean, you know, there's been times in my life, there's certainly one, one little stretch in my life where I wasn't the most responsible person in the world. Mm-hmm. And finally the light bulb came on. Yeah, sure. And, uh, and then when that light bulb came on, it has stayed on very bright ever since. <laughs> yeah, sure. And I think <laughs> and it's something, and, and, and even that negative experience for me is something I can share with my students and say, no, this, this, this is why you need to do this. And it's so that you get to do the things you say you want to do. Uh, yeah, they're not going to yeah. be handed to you, but, but you get an opportunity, you've got to take it. And uh, yeah. So I, I think even uh, our, you know, the things that we have done well as teachers and the things that might be uh, scrutinized still make us more effective teachers. I think yeah. all the, the collective of that makes us human and it's something we can share with others to make sure they go down, you know, they, they have the right avenues to get to where they want to go. Yeah, absolutely. Are you familiar yeah. with the Carol Dweck book, the, the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset? A good friend of mine had just recommended that book maybe two months ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, I was thinking about what you said about playing in the, in the brass quintet with musicians who were better than you and they made you better. Mm-hmm. But they only made you better because you were willing to take the risk to put yourself into a position where you might be failed mm-hmm. or criticized. And that made you better. Right. And I think a lot of times we we shy away from those experiences because we don't want to look bad or we don't want to fail. But you, you, right. you embrace that. Well, I mean, at that time, I mean, maybe it was just because of, you know, the uh, arrogance of youth. I thought I was on that level until I got in there and I went, OK, I'm not on this level, but I want to be on that level. And this guy's on this level. I'm going to like hitch this wagon to him <laughs> and, then, and try to get the most out of the experience. And I'll be honest with you. A lot of it, some of it is, you know, you can ask questions and you can do all that. That's some of it. Yeah, that's fine. But most of it to me was what I was hearing. And I took that sound and just put it in my head. It's like a soundtrack in my head. It's still in my head. I mean, every trombonist I ever hear has to be, you know, at that standard or, or higher, <laughs> or I'm going to ask you know, them to change something. And that's because, you know, I sat next to these people for so long that I, it, that sound is, is just absolutely mine now. I, I own that same sound in my head. I can't play trombone like them, but I know that's possible. And when you know that's possible and you know how great it is, then you strive for it all the time. I, I, our trombone teacher at UTSA, uh, John Ellica, he's, he's the principal trombone in North Carolina Symphony now. Hello, John. He sent me this. Yeah, yeah, John's great. John mm-hmm. John sends me, he sent me this recording of, of the low brass section. He's playing bass trumpet this year. And he sent me this recording of him and the tuba player playing uh, this Rachmaninoff piece. And it's just a little section of it. And he goes, I just want you to hear this. And I heard it. And it's that sound. It's that sound that makes you go, oh, my gosh, this is why we do what we do. <laughs> to be able to try to produce this, this amazing, uh, uh, you know, life-changing sound. <laughs> and I've been sharing that with everybody lately. I was like, you got to hear this. <laughs> sure, sure. Um, and you get excited about that sort of thing. And, and I'll be honest with you, that's some of the things I kind of miss uh, when I used to do all my large ensemble orchestral playing and, and wind ensemble playing was achieving those sounds. So now but those sounds become you. If you sit next to it and you're part of it, they become you. And then your expectation is so much higher after that. So, um, but I get excited about it. I, get, I mean, I was just thinking about that recording because John was excited to share it with me, and I was just blown away when I heard it. And I was like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> yeah. We should all have this experience. Yeah. So, yeah. So, oh boy, there's more things I want to, more tangents I want to go off of. Let me, let me clean up a couple things here first. So, mm-hmm. now you were in the Navy band for how long? Only four years. I only did one f- hitch. Only uh, four years. Yeah, okay. I was. I was 22 when I got in the band, and if I had to do it over again, I wish I would have gotten in when I was about maybe 28. 
Uh-huh. But at 22, I just had so many aspirations and everything to do so many other things. But man, it was such a great experience because again, I mean, the, the players I got to play with, I, they just taught me so much. Yeah, Amazing. sure. <laughs> Marty so, Erickson, I mean, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I'm also was thinking about you talking about starting bands and you started three separate yeah. concert band win ensembles. And I'm thinking yeah, about maybe a my, listener out there, maybe there's someone out there who's listening, thinking, you know what? I want to start a, a, a community band in my town. Uh-huh. or I want to start a new professional band in the area. You have any right. thoughts for them? Yeah, I got lots of thoughts. <laughs> maybe too many for this podcast. Well, maybe just a few. Um, how, how would you get started? Perhaps? Well, I'll, well or, I'll tell you first, first, you just have to be brave. You just have to be brave. And it's just like starting any kind of small business. Now that I, I own a small business, I can tell you this is very much uh, comparable is that you just have to be brave enough to realize if you fail, it's okay. But it's the reason why you may fail that might not be okay. Um, you have to put your all in it. You have to have vision and you have to you know, look at that vision and you have to be somewhat flexible, but you still want to meet the, the overall mission of what you're wanting to do. And one of the things I say, um, the first thing you have, but you have to be brave. You just have to be brave. <laughs> um, the first thing uh, I always do when I start any kind of organization or, or a, uh, a business or a any kind of entity, whether it's an ensemble like a brass quintet or something like that, I always draw up a mission statement. And why I draw up a mission statement is because it's what keeps you focused, it keeps you in the right direction. It takes a long time sometimes to mission statement right, but it's a concise, you know, direction that you should be going in, like the, you know, that you're, 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 you're really giving yourself a, a, a target. Um, and, and, and if you take the right amount of time to do it, you'll get it down to where it's really pretty economical with words. You know, maybe it's only a 50 word statement that really says, okay, every time I make a decision, I need to go back to that mission statement and see if I'm, if I'm on course, you know, it's just, it's just on track. And that's my biggest part of my biggest First big thing in advice is do the vision of the ensemble and then break it down and write that mission statement. And that would be the first thing I would say. Second thing is surround yourself around really great people, people smarter than you, people who may argue with you, but argue with you in the right way that they may have a difference of opinion, but they still see the big picture and the, uh, that they're not just arguing with you over a minute detail. That's later. Um, start with the big picture thinking that macro, micro, macro thing, just like score study. Hey, same thing. <laughs> um, it, you know, if you can really do that. That's, that's going to help you, or at least in my experience, it would help you, um, you know, again, keep on track and also not narrow so, yourself so much that you end up not doing what you hope to set out with, you know, to do in the first place. A lot of times people will compromise so much that then all of a sudden they realize, well, what they hope to do is no longer you know, possible because the, the, the direction got so narrow. Um, and then, you know, that's, that's a different thing, but get yourself around really good people, smart people who know what they're doing. Um, I'm the smartest thing, of course, I ever did was marry my wife and she's a tax accountant. And, um, I, I would love running things by her <laughs> because, you know, she knows so much more about uh, the, the, the tax code and certain financial things than I ever will. And when I run things by her, she can make me see things in a completely different perspective and then say, okay, all right, I can still do this, but I have to do this now. And uh, I think that's a big part of it. Um, you know, this, this, I did most of this creation, you know, I also created a conductor's conference. I created a brass festival and I did all these things in my, my late twenties and early thirties. Uh, I wish I had that kind of energy <laughs> still, but what I do have is I have a lot more knowledge now on, on how to do things and, and, and in what order to do them. And it's uh, served me very well, especially with the music school in Charlotte, um, because it's helped me keep the, uh, the right perspective and also um, you know, see the big picture, but also know the steps to get there. And, and one of the biggest things, again, uh, my advice would be see the big picture, work backwards, and you'll find the trail to get you to the big picture. Instead of trying to start from the, where you are now, and try to think progressively to it, working backwards to me is a lot. You get to see a lot more of the steps and you miss less. You don't get the Swiss cheese version of what you need to do. You get much more of, you know, a direct line to it. So I guess those are my, uh, my five minute advice. I can go on with that for maybe about another five hours, but I will not bore you. <laughs> so. I'm not bored yet. 
So you want to talk, <laughs> can you tell me a little bit about the Charlotte Music School, like the very nature of it, what it is? Yeah, we, well, this, this music school was started by, um, uh, by a piano teacher and her husband, who ironically, she was a piano teacher, her husband was a tax accountant. So we, we were the perfect people to purchase this since we had uh, the, the same type of makeup for owners. Um, she had a, a, a piano studio in Charlotte for nearly 20 years and it had done very well. And she started the school um, in 2006, uh, where she started hiring other teachers and, and started branching out into other instruments. And uh, they did quite well. They uh, they had a good business model. They uh, stuck to it. They you know got to a point where the music school was actually running very very well. Um, and then they decided they, they had some reasons why they needed, especially family reasons, to move to Florida. And in 2012, they moved to Florida. And when they did, they opened another music school. And then they realized they just couldn't run two music schools in two different states. So they decided to try to sell this one. And I was right at the same time where I was going, you know, um, and my wife just, I think it might've been the 18th straight sub-zero temperature day in Ann Arbor. <laughs> and uh, my wife looks at me and goes, when are you going to get us back to North Carolina? And I was kind of looked at her and went, yeah, well, you know what, maybe I'll look into some other things I'm interested in. And I used to run a music lessons program when I got out of the Navy band. I worked with the local schools quite a bit, and I ran a lesson program for what was called the Parkview Music Enhancement Society at Parkview High School in Sterling, Virginia. And I ran that school, and it had about 27 students when I when I took it over, and I had about 140 when I left. So I kind of felt like I was doing some right, the right things to make a school grow. So I felt pretty confident when I saw this you know business for sale that this would be something I'd be interested in doing. So we did a lot of due diligence. It takes you know, a lot to buy a small business. And, um, you know, I did a lot of research, a lot of planning. I even shopped the school. Like I, I visited it as a prospective, you know, um, a parent that had students. And I made up a little scenario and I went and completely shopped the school. And um, they passed every test. And, um, you know, I was, I really thought, okay, this is a, this is a good opportunity for us. So um, in the meantime, I was offered a job at UW Milwaukee. So, you know, I took that job not knowing that the, the sale of the school was going to go through. It did. So I lived in two places there for a while. I'm glad that that's – UW Milwaukee, by the way, is awesome. Milwaukee is a great place. I yeah. love Milwaukee. Yeah. Uh, but we knew we were going to end up in Charlotte and uh, with the school, or at least in North Carolina. So um, living in two places – so the school, um, you know, when we took it over, it was mostly just private lessons. Uh, we've added some classes. We've added some different instruments like woodland and brass instruments. That, uh, that's definitely a growth potential. Um, you know, it's you'll learn that there are um, when you buy a small business like this, it's in a commercial um, uh, shopping center, and um, leasing is no joke. <laughs> There's a lot of expenses involved. Uh, but it is, uh, the school is, is, I think right now we are at our peak. Um, I believe right this moment, we're a little over 270 students. And so it's the most students we've ever had. Um, so we're, we're doing well. Uh, we have, uh, 17 teachers who teach with us currently, um, ranging from mostly piano. Piano is by far the most common instrument, uh, you know, of common, uh, request for uh, lessons. Um, but we also offer guitar, and piano, uh, drum set. Um, I wish we could add more percussion. There is more space for that. I'm hoping we can add that in the future. Um, violin is, is, is really taking off. Cello is just starting. Um, the We have voice, voice lessons. Uh, I teach tuba and uh, trombone. We have a, a horn teacher who is just fantastic. He's young and just a real great just a go-getter. He's really, really, I think he's going to, he has a bright future ahead of him. Uh, we have a Woodlands teacher. Uh, I'm hoping that eventually we can break that down more uh, just with the number of students we have. But then um, we also teach ukulele, accordion. We have a great accordion teacher. Uh, so it, we, we cover pretty much the full gamut of, uh, of acoustic instruments. And um, we're hoping to do even more with that. But all our students do recitals. We, we do two big recitals. We run out of concert hall and do two big recitals a year. We do master classes every week. Um, so it's, it's a very active school. Um, it's, there's about 22 of these schools in Charlotte, by the way. Oh, wow. Uh, they all circle. Yeah. So uh, I'm hoping in the future that maybe we, that we'll, we'll, we'll start looking at per possibly purchasing another school and maybe another one. And 
I'll be honest with you. If I if I'm worth my weight in anything in this, I hope um, maybe ten years from now or so that we're able to start offering jobs to um, to teachers that are more like full time jobs. Where I say, hey, would you teach two days at this school, two days at this school, play in this ensemble I created, and this is how much it pays, you know, a salary of that. If I ever get to that point, then I've done something right. Um, but that's that's certainly in our ten year plan. So yeah. I'm hoping that's what eventually happens. Yeah. It's a real job for a musician. Mark, your, your entrepreneurial spirit and your, your knowledge is really impressive. And the one thing I'm really coming through is that the due diligence that you did for this. Oh, oh my goodness. You, you, the, the business plan is over a hundred pages long. Yeah. So it's like a dissertation. <laughs> um, in fact, it's longer than my dissertation. Um, so it, it, and in fact, it, you know, when you do it, you'll realize the more and more you do it, the more and more you have to do it because you have to know whether, I mean, if I buy this business, it's, you know, this was our retirement money when we bought this business. So um, there's a great risk involved. And yeah. when you buy a music school, you're essentially buying a database yeah. and a bunch of instruments, right, you know, sure. but nothing close to what it's worth because you're buying a database. And um, so you really have to to know what you're doing. And at the same time, you want to make sure you're providing the right education for these students. So, you know, it's not a matter of just, oh gosh, please, anybody come, you know, mm-hmm. and do anything. You, you want to hold, the, you know, have some standard of learning here. And um, I'm saying that you got to make sure you're doing the right thing and you have to check yourself quite a bit. But that due diligence is what makes it possible. And I'm so glad that we, my wife and I invested the time we did uh, because we, we know so much more about running a school than we did when we first, you know, decided, hey, maybe we should own a music school, <laughs> which I said, is kind of like, you know, hey, let's buy a zoo. can you think of anything specific that applies to the band room for a band director listening about that due diligence oh yeah well first mission statement um i do this now with all my ensembles i write myself a mission statement i don't always share it with the ensemble sometimes i do but uh most of the time i do it for me to make sure that i'm doing the right things and programming and my scheduling and you you know uh, the concerts that we're doing or what are they what what is the purpose of this you know what are they getting out of this and so that's one thing is I would, you know, especially on the high school level, I would write a mission statement for your ensemble and, and revisit it every year because it may possibly change a little bit. But uh, that would be, that'd be one recommendation I'd say right off the bat. Two is, of course, you know, everybody hears us, take care of the money. Um, make sure that you know, you know, what you should know. Um, you know, we've, we've seen this a lot where people get into financial trouble. And I wish at colleges we, we did a better job of preparing our uh, music educators um, for the, the business side of, of running things. Because if the money doesn't add up uh, and people start pointing fingers, they're going to stop listening to you as a physician and they're going to stop listening to you as a teacher. They're going to start questioning your, your ethics and your integrity. And that's where it becomes impossible to teach because people don't believe you. Um, so I, I, my biggest advice is one, uh, take a business course, goodness gracious, take it, especially accounting. Um, if, if not, um, make sure you get around somebody who can help you. So you understand what that means. Uh, especially if you have a, a, a really strong band booster program, uh, just make sure you know what's going on. And then the second part of it is get that mission statement to make sure that you're moving in the right direction all the time. Um, that's my advice. Yeah. Yeah. I have a friend who took over a program where the band boosters had just embezzled some money and he's had to rebuild the whole yeah. thing. That's it just devastates a program. It really does. You lose all momentum when that happens yeah. and it takes so much, you know, you know, there's a good line. I mean, Andrew Schitt says this a lot that Andrew says, you know, it takes a lifetime to build your reputation and five minutes to destroy it. <laughs> Um, that's totally true. And you can spend all this time building your program and getting the right people in place and all this. And then something like that happens and you, you take giant steps backwards, uh, that takes so many more years to recover from. So, um, it's just making sure, you know, you understand what should be happening and then you'll know, then you, when you double check, you know, you can make sure the right things are going on. So. Yeah. It's, you know, Andrew's yeah. statement about that, you know, what I think about when I, when mm-hmm. he says that is it's about consistency and you know, if you're mm-hmm. consistent in the way you think about the world and the way you approach the world, I, I'll tell a little story. I, I have a humiliating story from a few years ago, work with a student, work with a student as an undergraduate. And then just in a fit of 
frustration one day, I complained to a colleague about the student and it got back to him. And I am so humiliated yeah. by that. It was such a silly little mistake, but it ruined all that work I put in. And, you know, it's yeah, just one of those learning experiences. Right. And we're all human. We're going to make these kinds right. of mistakes. I got frustrated uh, and let it come out. That, yeah. And that awareness, I mean, it's, it, we all learn from it. I, I, I tell this story. I was asked this on the job interview once. What was my, my, my lowest moment as a teacher? And it was when I was a percussionist that uh, was frustrating me during a rehearsal. And I, uh, I kind of showed him up. And I knew as soon as I, I, I saw it and I recognized it and realized I had lost that student at that, at that moment. Exactly. And I even stopped the ensemble and apologized. But it was too late. Yeah. It was done. Yeah, no, I know. And that, he was never going to trust me again. And I, I, I took a big step back. And, you know, if there's one thing I could tell my younger self, <laughs> I would tell my younger self, never take anything personally on the phone. Well, you know, that's, that's one of my questions on the podcast. Myself. So is that going to be your <laughs> yeah, advice? Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. big, my big one. Is just don't, it, it's not personal. You're there for a reason. And it's about them. It's not about you. It's about them. And so, um, you know, there are times when you have to, you know, correct certain things, but um, you have how you do it has to be for that purpose, not for your personal, you know, angst. <laughs> so in that case, so I mean, I lost that student, and I've, I've remembered that ever since. And yeah, I it know. Was, I... It was 2002, and in, in, on February 10th, yeah, I can just funny. tell you when it was. Yeah. I remember it very well. I know. I still, yeah. I, I still feel bad about that experience. And you know, it won't, yeah. it won't be the last time I make a mistake, but it would, that was a bad one. And that mm -hmm. one, that one stung. What are the challenges facing music education as we move mm -hmm. forward into the 21st century? Wow. Well, you know, I, I see my challenge. I see the challenges, from maybe a, a different perspective than um, those who are teaching in the public schools and, and having done so much in the public schools, but I've never been a, teacher in the public schools. Um, I feel like my perspective is only my perspective. And the first thing I see, of course, is just from a, a, a again, a human and a business standpoint, which is, especially here in North Carolina, is just a commitment to the teachers. It's, it's being lessened, uh, you know, every year here in North Carolina. It just seems, you know, they want to take away certain things that, that, that a teacher could rely on and or entering that kind of an occupation, um, it, it's eventually not going to compete very well with other occupations. And there's so many sacrifices you make as a teacher anyway, mostly your time, um, which people don't take account for. Uh, well, I say people, but I would say some of the people that are um, recommending these cuts. Um, you know, when you start cutting somebody's pension and you start cutting, okay, then you no longer have the right to have tenure or uh, your pay scale is so out of whack with, you know, as far as like pay raises and what have you, that they, they don't compete well, you know, even with a, a modest job. Um, and yet still, there's so much responsibility that you're supposed to absorb. And a lot of the, so the, the biggest challenge I see right now is, is, are we taking care of these teachers? Are we allowing them the, uh, one, the ability to want to do this, the two, also the ability to grow in it. And are they going to get the benefit of staying in for 30 years and teaching? Um, are we also going to um, mentor them? And the mentorship thing to me, I think is, is a, a big challenge. I think um, all of us have to take, you know, especially, uh, I mean, especially those of us who have been around a few years, you know, I'm in my 30th year of in this business and I feel like I have some things to share and I, and I, I want to share them, but I also want to share them the right way. Um, I don't know everything. Gosh, no. <laughs> but if there's something I can say that can, you know, spur another thought that is the right thought, then I've done my job. Um, and I think we have to find more ways to mentor our younger um, or less experienced teachers and at the same time, let them have that energy and, you know, let them have their own voice at the same time. So I think, I think mentorship is, is also a big challenge right now. Um, I'm actually putting, we're putting something together here at UNCSA for band directing and mentorship that we're starting this year. Um, and we think it's really well needed and we're really hoping it will take off here in North Carolina. But, um, you know, that's still in the, in the organizational stage. But it's, um, to me, I think that's one of the biggest parts is, is the teachers. Are the teachers being fed? Are they being, 
mentored and given a chance to grow and getting a chance to learn because so many, even, even a lot of school districts now won't allow them to go their, to their own state conferences. And I just don't understand that. Why don't you want your teachers to grow? <laughs> so I, I, I have the support for teachers to me is a big part of that challenge for music education. There's so many things that, that students compete with nowadays. I mean, there's, there's so many things to get involved with. And then there's a lot of parents who want them to be doing everything. So they consistently ask, you know, can I, can they miss this? Can they miss this? Can they miss this? Because they got soccer, soccer coach won't let them miss a practice, but it's okay to miss a band practice. I'm not really sure I understand the logic there. Um, you know, there, all those things, I think uh, people do have to make a, a decision to commitment. But here's the thing that really gets, that really makes me uh, be very incredibly hopeful for the future is I, I adjudicated a uh, marching band competition a couple of weeks ago. And oh my goodness, the commitment level of those students is just so high. They And they are so, I mean, you could just tell how, I mean, on nearly every band I saw, you would see this uh, this commitment level to what they were doing that is inspiring. Um, that, I think, uh, it shows that there's still a lot of uh, need and a lot of desire for what uh, a band uh, program can offer to the education of a student. Um, I think that's, just, you just get to see it and you go, yep, yeah, that's, that's why they do this. And they make a lot of sacrifices to do that. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful. I just think we need to take care of these teachers a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. No question. I, you yeah. know, I, I don't want to make this a political thing and it's not, but you know, the idea mm-hmm. that, um, the market will take care of things doesn't oh, apply when oh, pe- yeah. it doesn't apply when people are called to a profession because people who exactly. are called to a profession tend to be taken advantage of by the market and teachers are called. Right. Exactly. And, and there has to be the, some people. And, and I think maybe it's, it's, you know, um, there's some of us that have to be that advocate for those, those people who are called that we can't let them be taken advantage of that. We have to work or we have to find our own ways to, to make sure that those people are still taken care of down the road or they won't be there in the future. And gosh, nothing's worse than being called to do something and not being able to do it. Um, that would be tragic. So um, I do think there's uh, some responsibility there for all of us to make sure that uh, we're allowing these things to, you know, these great things to, to still remain and take, and take place. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Mark. So I'm going to ask you the, uh, the question I ask everyone and I've, I've, I've twisted it around here now, not, not your favorite work for wind band, but what is the, what is the last work you would want to conduct? I'll tell you just one thing. I know I'm a little long winded anyway, but I'll, I'll say this anyhow. First, I think yeah, I used to write down my, my top 20 pieces and I used to like change that list all the time. And, and, you know, I think back at the beginning of my career, I think about the literature we had and the, and these awesome works like the hand of the symphony and the miniature posy. And of course, all these amazing works of child garden dreams. I was like, oh, that, that changed my life. I didn't realize we could do that when I was a freshman and played that piece. Oh my goodness. And, and my favorite pieces have changed over the years. Um, and they should, you know, and I'd like to say this, I always love the piece I'm conducting right now the most, because that's my job. I, I shouldn't be conducting if I don't love it. So I'm doing aesthetic waters right now. I love aesthetic waters. I love aesthetic waters all the time. <laughs> Um, I, I love the challenges of that piece. I just love the timbre and how he integrates, uh, how Steve Bright integrates the electronic. Um, but I just think we're so lucky right now that we have had so many great composers contribute to this repertoire that we have just amazing pieces. Uh, to answer your question directly, I would have first said Mahler 6, but since we're talking about Limbach, um, I'm thinking more personal. Um, I, the piece that would come to my mind right now and it might change, but right now I say it's Frozen Cathedral, um, the Frozen Cathedral, because of you know, the John Mackey piece. Because um, one, it, it, it was um, commissioned by my mentor John Locke, and it has a story behind it, um, which I'm very, very familiar with and connected with. And then the other part of it is um, I, the first time I got to conduct it, I was covering a rehearsal for John Clymer at UW Milwaukee, and uh, I learned about oh. Well, 10 minutes before that rehearsal that my, my father was, uh, um, unfortunately about to pass. And we, we came very quickly and I was walking and I knew that, you know, all I did right before that rehearsal was, um, make arrangements for me to get back to North Carolina. And, uh, 
but I had, I was covering that rehearsal and it was absolutely, uh, it was God sent. That was what I needed. And I went and did that rehearsal and I mean, I worked straight through the piece and I mean, at the end of it, I felt this connection, you know, and this, um, this thing. And I remember players saw it too. And we, we talked about it a little bit and I just I didn't really see what was going on. with me. I just said, this just means so much right now. And I did it. So I, yeah. And so if, if I'm going to end on one piece, I would like to end on that. Please let it be the downbeat of the last bar. <laughs> Please let me get through the yeah, end and then, okay, yeah. take me away. <laughs> I don't know. I think I, but I, yeah. 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 No, I those are so personal. That's why. Yeah. Those emotional connections are really important. I don't know if I've told the story on this mm-hmm. podcast, but when I was, I mean, I've mentioned him before, but my college band director was Dan Eastand. And uh, when I was there, he, our first semester, my second semester, some early on in my career, he told us how he wanted the last piece he wanted to conduct to be the, the, the arrangement of Crown Imperial by William Walton. Mm-hmm. And so we, we were playing it that semester. And then he passed away from cancer when I was a junior. Wow. And at his memorial concert, we played Crown Imperial. And I just cried the whole piece. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to play trumpet that way, but we managed. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it, it's, it's amazing, though. You know, I've been in that experience before where you get so emotionally wrapped up into something. But again, it's just uh, the power of what we get to do. Right, and it's what makes what we do so special. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, it makes us human, and it, and it connects us in these ways. And, and for those who, you know, those that, that think that this isn't something essential to our being, I, I guess wholeheartedly disagree. <laughs> I, I mean, you got, when you see people go through this and how it connects with them, I, I think the emotive qualities or the emotive aspects of music and, and what we do are, uh, I think they're, they're heavily regarded or, or greatly regarded, but I also think they're highly underrated. <laughs> so, I agree. uh, yeah, it's, but, but yeah, yeah, that's, that, that would be mine. For right now, that would be mine. <laughs> yeah. So your episode is scheduled for uh, October 23rd. Great. Knowing that, is there anything that you'd like to share or promote? Well, I, I mean, right now I have a, a few things in development. This uh, this this band director, conductor, uh, mentorship program, uh, um, it, we are just about to, to try to get it going off the ground. We have a date set and everything. We have a clinician set. Um, this is something that Bill Briggs and I, uh, are putting together. Uh, Bill was the, was the music educator of the year, Grammy award winner two years ago. And Bill's a good friend of mine and, and a North Carolina person and from our area. And so we've been trying to put together something here where we connect things. I can just blaze up my house. Um, <laughs> uh, sorry, hold on one second. It's okay. Uh, somebody just came to our house. Uh, I'm just going crazy. All right. As they oh, tend to do. I can say that again if I can. <laughs> no, it's okay. Our listeners have, have okay. pets. They know. Oh, I love it. Great. Well, that's my, <laughs> that's my dog, Miles. <laughs> uh, so anyway, the uh, um, yeah, that, that particular thing is something I'm really um, interested in, and, and I certainly would love to promote it in the future. Uh, we're doing it first uh, here in North Carolina, and then we're, we're hoping that uh, it meets a need. And if it does, then we're going to try to expand it. So uh, I don't really have a date or anything to give everybody, but I would say that, uh, that's the one thing that, uh, stay tuned. <laughs> that's probably the best way to put it. Cool. Uh, cool. Other than that, we have a great concert coming up on November 6th, Static Waters, David Bryant. Excellent. Yeah. So how can people get in touch with you? Uh, my email is normanm at uncsa.edu. And that's, uh, that's probably the best way to get a hold of me. Uh, but if you're interested in anything with the Charlotte Music School, it's Mark Norman at charlottemusicschool.com. Long name, easy to remember. Uh, but feel free to contact me either place. And um, if you have any questions or, you know, slide comments, feel free. <laughs> Mark, thanks for a terrific conversation. Hey, same here, Mark. Thank you very much. I love, love the podcast. So thank you very much for doing it. Oh, thanks so much. I appreciate that. Yeah.